This past year has been such a trying year for many in our communities. The beautiful day on the Abonito Show would like to dedicate this season to all of our frontline workers and to those we have lost due to COVID. We offer our condolences to those families who have forever been changed due to this pandemic. We are with you and we look forward to coming together once again. I am your host, Dorimar Bonilla. Welcome to the beautiful day on the Abonito Show. Welcome to our debut season of The Beautiful Day on The Abonito Show. I am your host, Dorimar Bonilla, and I am so excited to share with you all the many things that make our Latin community and culture so wonderful. I was born and raised in the island of Puerto Rico. I grew up very connected to my culture and my family. And since I was a very young girl, I always knew I wanted to be in entertainment. I always said that I wanted to be a professional dancer, even when I really didn't know what that meant. But I always knew that I wanted to explore the world, that I wanted to entertain. I originally started entertaining people at my grandma's living room every Sunday. We would gather the entire family. My grandparents had 11 children and I think about 25, 30, no, 32 grandchildren and 25 great grandchildren by the time that my grandparents passed away. And we all grew up like brothers and sisters. We were very tight. And every Sunday, all of us, the big family would gather at my grandmother's house. And I always had to put on a show for them. I remember my aunt, she used to have this fringe dress that she used to put on me and actually on her it was a top but it was so tiny that on me it was a dress and i used to impersonate iris chacon now that i'm telling my age but um for those of you who are familiar with Iris Chacon, she was a Puerto Rican singer and dancer that appeared in television, um, and I used to be obsessed with her. She was one of my first influences in dance, and I just knew my entire life that I wanted to be an entertainer, but I also grew up very, very tight with my family, and the Puerto Rican culture was something that well, to me, it just, it was normal, right? And I know now having traveled the world, having experienced other cultures that people look at cultures as they each have their own thing. But for me, that was the norm. And I carry that with me everywhere I go. One of my favorite memories, I would say, growing up on the mountains, we used to have our own fruit trees. And my grandpa and I, we used to gather the coffee beans we used to grow our own coffee and we would gather the coffee beans we would lay them on the sun for two three days until they were roasted and i remember we used to have this grinding machine and we used to clamp uh, the base of it to one of our mango trees the root of uh, the roots of our mango trees and we would grind the coffee there and making our own coffee was so special I've been drinking coffee since I was a little girl. I know children are not supposed to drink coffee, but it's one of those things that it doesn't matter where I am in the world. When I get the smell of coffee, it brings me right back home. It brings me back to the mountain, to Puerto Rico, and I feel like it doesn't matter where I am. I don't lose sense of who I am. So that's one of my favorite memories with my family. But, um, you know, growing up, I just... I knew that I had to explore my dance skills and my abilities. My father always, because I was very chatty in school, as you can tell, I'm very chatty. My dad always had me in dance school as a way to discipline me because he knew that I enjoyed dancing so much. And my dad was an educator and he knew that was the key to discipline, to have me in dance school and have me doing something that I loved. And 
have it a little bit of a trade. If you do well in school, if I don't have complaints about you chatting too much in the classroom, then I will continue to have you in dance class. And even though my dad never wanted me to be entertain an entertainer, he provided me with the tools to become a professional artist. And for that, I am so grateful to him. I was able to move to Las Vegas um, at a young age, and I perform in magic shows, hypnosis, hypnosis shows, production shows. I was an entertainment reporter. You name it, I did everything. I choreographed everything that I wanted to do. I was so blessed that I was able to do. And after being in Las Vegas for a few years, I had the opportunity to participate on the Latin Dancing with the Star shows. Um, the first one that I did was Miss Sueños Bailar, which, which filmed in Los Angeles, very close to Las Vegas. I used to drive back and forth at the time, and I did a couple of seasons of that. Then I was blessed to uh, land a role in the cast of Mira Quem Baila with Univision. It's another one of the Latin Dancing with the Stars. And those were great opportunities for me and great experiences. But I always knew that at some point I wanted to retire from dance and be on the other side of entertainment. And now being here with the beautiful Day on Dia Bonito show, it gives me the opportunity to still entertain and to connect with the community. And I am so blessed and looking forward to sharing this experience with all of you. We at the beautiful Day on Dia Bonito show not only bring you highlights of our Latin culture, but we also engage with our community as often as possible. As you know, 2020 was a challenging year, and while we still have some ways to go, we wanted to stay connected with our people in the safest way possible. Over the holiday season, we had the opportunity to partner up with some incredible charitable organizations. This year, we will be working closely with the Women's United Initiative, supporting single mothers via the Pocono Mountains United Way. Also, we had the opportunity to work on a public service announcement to support the arts and the Sherman Theater via the Fine Arts Discovery Series. That was a fun one that you will really enjoy. As you know, the arts and entertainment have played a big role in my life and career, so this particular effort is very meaningful to me. We also had the opportunity to celebrate some of our traditional holidays with our production team who was able to connect with the children of our community during a Three Kings Day toy drive. Throughout 2021, we look forward to staying connected and you will see some of our community work during this season. But first, you have to meet the rest of our cast. So coming up next, stay tuned as we introduce you to our new co-hosts for this season, Alexa Sanchez and Monique lynch Cosme. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the beautiful day on Dia Bonito Show. I am your host, Dorimar Bonilla, and I am thrilled to introduce to you our co-hosts for season four. First up is Monique lynch Cosme, a fitness and wellness professional from Bergen County, New Jersey. Welcome, Monique. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you guys. We are thrilled to have you this season. Will you share with our viewers a little about yourself? Absolutely. So I'm an Afro-Latina that's passionate about holistic health and wellness. I'm also a super mom of four, so it really hits home for me. I want to make sure I bring to the show a passion for loving yourself, mind, body, and soul, and really infusing the benefits of taking great care of ourselves. Well, we are looking forward to getting healthy with you. So thank you for all the insight you're going to share with us this season. Also, we have Alexa Sanchez, a real estate associate broker in Pennsylvania. She is a multi-million dollar producer, and we are excited to have her join us this season and share all her knowledge with us. Welcome, Alexa. Thank you, Dory. Will you share a little about yourself as well? Absolutely, Dory. I am born and raised in New York City of Dominican parents, and I'm actually the first U.S. born citizen in my oh, family. Wow. 15 years ago, I moved to Pennsylvania with my wonderful children, became an associate broker, and have become a multi-million dollar producer, as you mentioned earlier. That's through, exciting. Yes, through those endeavors, I have been able to reach out to my community and volunteer with Special Olympics and other beautiful organizations. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're very lucky to have you. 
What are some of your wishes for this year? Absolutely. So I feel because we've been given sort of a clean slate with 2020 to start fresh and build new platforms, I really would love to see more for mental health advocacy. I would love to see more advocacy for our first responders and have more platforms for them and their loved ones. So that way they'll be able to serve us best. And in addition to that, also take very good care of themselves. Our health is our wealth, and I think this year has really highlighted that for us. Absolutely. How about you, Alexa? What do you look forward to? You know, Monique almost took the words right out of my mouth. You know, I look forward to, actually, let me, re, let me rephrase that. I feel like 2020 was almost a reset, and the mental health aspect is very, very important. As you, and I know Monique knows, I do have a person with special needs that lives in my home, and being in quarantine, as to say, has been very difficult. And I've noticed that mental health, not just for my child, but for the community itself, has almost been overlooked. And there's more outreach now where we need that mental health stability. But at the same time, I look forward to the new lifestyle changes. I'm actually enjoying conferencing with clients via Zoom and removing the commute times. Yes. So it's given me more time to drink water. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And exercise. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's given a lot of people a better work-life balance, which it's something that, I mean, many other countries, and for us, for me, coming from Puerto Rico, um, other countries seem to have a little bit more of a work-life balance mm -hmm. than we do here in America. And I think that people here in America, when they were sort of forced to take a pause, they looked at things and they said, wait a minute, I kind of like this. Yes. yes. And yeah. it's funny you said that because I actually incorporated, I remember as a child in the Dominican Republic, siesta time after lunch. Yes. I actually began incorporating that and that has been so beneficial just for my own well-being. Yes, yes. We are taking the good that we can keep and we're going to move forward with that and it's going to be an amazing 2021 and season four of the beautiful day on the Bonita show and don't go anywhere because coming up the one and only Julie Torres will be joining us for an intimate interview stay tuned Welcome back to Beautiful Day on Dia Bonito. I am your host, Dorimar Bonilla, and today we have an icon in music, dubbed the queen of freestyle, an actress, and popular New York DJ on WKTU. Please welcome to Beautiful Day on Dia Bonito, Judy Torres. Hello, Dorimar. How are you? I am doing well. How are you? <laughs> good. Very good. Thank you for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to have you here. You are such an icon in music, and we're going to talk about your career in a brief moment, but I want to hear about your background, because I hear you have a little bit of Boricua in you. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, I was born here, and my mother is Puerto Rican. My father is from Cuba, so I'm a Puerto Rican Cuban. I'm a Cuba Boricua. Cuba Boricua. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, the, the food is pretty much the same. So in pretty your much. house, I, I'm sure everybody, there's no fights over what they're eating. No, we all love it. Love it. And as I mentioned before, you're such an icon in the music industry. And as a breakout out, uh, artist with hits like Come Into My Arms and No Reason to Cry, you inspired a generation of freestyle followers that they still follow you through today. Yeah. How did it feel to be so young, to be a woman and a Latina, and to make such an impact in the music industry? Well, it felt very exciting and very humbling because, you know, when you're young, you're 17, you have a dream to be a singer, and then all of a sudden your songs are on the radio, it's like, oh my God, it's a dream come true. And then to know that the people in your neighborhood look up to you because you're one of them, and they love to know that somebody succeeded, it's, yes. it's a great feeling and a blessing. What, what are some of your musical influences? You know, it's funny, my musical influences are the big crooners from back in the day. So I love Judy Garland. I love Liza Minnelli. I love, you know, the Rat Pack. That, I like that kind of music. And I, I love that those entertainers always told stories before they sang the songs. Yes. So for me, that's important because they connect with the audience. And that's how I get to connect with the audience too. Awesome. Yeah, I love that style of music as well. It's Thank timeless. Mm -hmm. um, and you also had a very extensive gig at uh, WKTU in New York in the radio station. What is it about radio that you love? I think 
the thing that I share with entertaining and being on the radio is connecting with people and in music. You know, music is the universal language. Yes. People can disagree about politics, they can disagree about religion, but the second everyone likes one song, all of a sudden people are united. So to be on the radio, in addition to that, is another way to connect, you know? Yes. Tell me one of your most memorable moments in radio. Hmm. My first day on the air, I was really nervous. We have about 5 million listeners, and I did my first break, 103.5 KTU, The Beat of New York, and I accidentally left the microphone on. And Oops. so <laughs> I had stuttered because I was so nervous. I, I messed up and I said, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. I'm so stupid, oh God. And all of a sudden I on looked down at, on the hot mic and I looked down and all the phone lines are lit. And I'm like, wow, this is, a, this is amazing. Hello, Kate, to you. They're like, your mic is still on. I'm like, oh my God. And then I turned the mic off. And, but it was great because so many people were supportive and they called, they said, hey, it's okay. It's your first day. Don't worry about it. Oh, wow. And so um, all, I say, all I can say is I'm so happy that I didn't curse and I didn't say anything inappropriate. But, but you also learned quickly after your first day, oh, I'm and, sure. I mean, it just, it happened to me uh, a couple of Sundays because of the pandemic. You know, we're doing it from home now. And I did it again. I left the mic on Oops. and I happened to be speaking to somebody about, about social media drama. And I didn't find out till the next morning. But again, thank God I don't say anything inappropriate. So, well, you know, you're a lady, so that works out. <laughs> thank in your God. Benefit. <laughs> and you're also an actress yes. inventing yourself and mm -hmm. your career mm -hmm. and selling out performances in New York with mm -hmm. your one woman show. No, re no reason to cry. Yeah. How did it feel when you started to sell tickets for that? Because I know that, you know, when you switch within the industry into a new outlet, it can be a little nerve wracking and you're exploring something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was probably the most terrifying thing I ever did in my career because I was turning 50. And really, I just did it because I wanted to be able to say that I did something in my career I never did before. So I wrote the show and then it was supposed to be just one weekend. So we promoted it on social media, nothing else on social media, and within 45 minutes it sold out. And I just couldn't believe it. And then the next thing I know, the theater called and said, can you, can you do another weekend? We did another weekend and it turned into another, another until like four months. And it was just the greatest experience wow. of my career. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and that taught me, that specific show taught me that the thing that you're afraid of is a thing you need to go after. I love it. It's mm -hmm. amazing. And uh, what was the inspiration behind that show? Well, like I said, I think it was the fact that I wanted to do something different. And I had seen all of John Leguizamo's um, uh, one man shows. Yes. And I just thought, you know, it'd be great if a woman could do that. And yes. so he kind of inspired me with that. And I, I think that was the inspiration, just, uh, just to try something completely different, something that I'm uncomfortable with and it worked out really great. Oh, good, that's, that's so good to find also another Latino who is doing great things in the industry and find inspiration behind what, behind what he's doing and mm -hmm. um, having it as an influence is also a great thing to have. Uh, but at a personal level, in 2005, mm -hmm. you were diagnosed with MS. Mm -hmm. What were the first symptoms, symptoms that brought you to see the doctor? Well, when I, when I was diagnosed, before I was diagnosed, I remember waking up, you know, when you have an eyelash stuck in your eye and mm -hmm. you can't get it out, it, that's yes. kind of what it felt like on my right eye. And then um, from there it proceeded to, by the end of the day, I had a splitting headache. I couldn't see red, I noticed that. And that night I had KTU. So when I finished my shift, I covered my eye and I tried to read the liner and I couldn't read. Wow. And I, I thought that that's weird went to sleep and the next day I was completely blind. So wow. it took about four days to get to a neurologist and the neurologist sent me to the hospital. So I was there for a week on IV steroids because they hope that it brings the inflammation down. It's basically, uh, I had what they call optic neuritis, which is the, the optic nerve becomes inflamed. Okay. It, it's what attaches the brain to the eye, that's how you see. And so it was very inflamed and that's how I found out. So series of MRIs and a spinal tap, a very painful spinal tap, and then they diagnosed me. What a journey, mm -hmm. what a journey. And I know that you don't want for that to take over your life and mm -hmm. you have a different way in the way you look at things when it comes to MS. Mm -hmm. What has become your mantra, share that with our viewers? I have a few rules. Yes. So for example, 
I try not to bring it up unless it's brought up first. That's number one. Number two, if I write about it, multiple sclerosis, so the letters MS always get small letters. Okay. Because if I make a capital, I make it important. I don't want to make it important. Good. You know? The third thing is I try not to pay attention to it because I think if I don't pay attention to it, it doesn't pay attention to me. Good. And then last, you go to the doctor. You yes. go to the doctor and you take care of yourself and you do whatever you can to keep the stress down and just live a life. Act as if you don't have it, but realize that you have to be realistic and, yeah. and be sure you get your checkups. I love that you don't let it take over your life. You can't. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I can't feel my left toe. That seems to be the only symptom I have. But, okay. Uh, Do symptoms come and go? For everyone who's diagnosed with MS is very different. Okay. So no, no two people have the same story. Okay. Um, but it, it involves, it affects the nerves, basically. MS is, you know, when we have our nerves, it's protected by this thing called myelin. Think of an electric cord and the rubber that's around the electric cord, right? And it helps send messages from your brain to your entire body so your body functions the way you want it to. With multiple sclerosis, it causes an autoimmune reaction, which means your body attacks itself. And it starts to take away at the myelin, starts to strip it away. And then in place of it, it creates plaque. Mm. And because of that, then the signals from the brain don't go to the body appropriately. So some people can have uh, nerve issues, tingling, numbness. Um, some people get paralysis. And some people, unfortunately, die. It doesn't have a cure to MS. Right. There is no cure. So, um, but, you know, I'm blessed and I keep on going. Good. That's the attitude to have. And I also learned recently that you are a life coach. What is exactly life coaching? Hmm. I think that nobody makes it successful by themselves. We all need somebody behind us. We yes. all need someone to direct us, to mentor us. And I think that's basically what life coaching is. It's, it's similar to therapy in the confidentiality is the same, but at the same time, you know, you're able to guide and direct and talk to and share stories with. And you basically, I'm just, I'm a cheerleader, I'm a mentor, I'm a goal getter, and I help set specific goals so you can achieve the goals you want. What is next for you comes 2021? Well, we were getting ready to bring back the one woman show. So I hope that we get to bring it back because of the pandemic. Right now, everything is up in yeah. the air. So in the meantime, you know, I continue with the life coaching and I'm also writing a book called No Reason to Cry. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. And um, where can people learn more about you and about your life coaching? Okay. Well, social media uh, is at Judy Torres Music. And for life coaching, for life coaching, it's Judy Torres Life Coach .com. Judy, it's been such a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Shake, you can.